In this episode, you'll learn which opportunities open up for you as a service design professional when you start designing with the planet in mind. Here's the guest for this episode. Let the show begin. Hi, I'm Kat and this is The Service Design Show, episode 142. Hi, I'm Mark and welcome back to The Service Design Show. On this show, we explore what's beneath the surface of service design. What are the hidden things that make a difference between success and failure, all to help you design services that have a positive impact on people, business, and planet. Our guest in this episode is Kat Drew. Kat is currently the Chief Design Officer at the UK Design Council. And in this episode, we're going to talk about one of the biggest, if not the biggest design challenge we're currently facing as a society, and that's the global climate crisis. Somehow, designing with the planet in mind has been more quickly adopted by other design disciplines. Service design seems to be lagging behind a little bit. So in this episode, we're going to talk about the responsibility you have as a service design professional to actually do that, to actually design solutions that put the planet at the heart and how to do that. Kat shares some very encouraging examples of services that have been designed this way. But we'll also discuss the two big roadblocks that we need to overcome in order to get quicker and more wider adoption of this approach. So if you stick around till the end of this conversation, you'll know exactly what we mean when we talk about designing for planet, which opportunities it brings for you as a service design professional and which tools and frameworks there already are that you can start using in your own practice today. If you enjoy conversations like this that help you to grow as a service design professional, know that we bring a new episode every week or so here on the channel. So if you'd like to stay updated, make sure you click that subscribe button and that bell icon to get a notification when a new video comes out. So that about wraps it up for the introduction. Now it's time to jump into the conversation with Kat Drew. Welcome to the show, Kat. Thank you for having me here. Awesome uh, to have you on. Finally, we managed to uh, schedule <laughs> uh, this chat and I'm really happy that we did because we're going to address a topic um, which you've been uh, uh, sort of promoting and advocating uh, for a while now. And mm -hmm. uh, I haven't heard it are ra being raised too often in the service design community. So I think we're going to introduce something which is really valuable and new. But before we dive into that, for the people who haven't Googled you yet, Kat, give, could you give a short introduction of uh, who you are and what you do these days? Sure. So I'm Kat Drew. I'm the Chief Design Officer at the UK Design Council. And my role there is to, first of all, champion Design for Planet which I'll be talking about, and to bring together design practice from across design disciplines, from architecture to service design to product design, to think about new ways that we can design for planet, and then to create the right policy conditions to make it easier for designers to do that. Awesome. Um, I, I'd love to know a bit more about your background, but we'll get to that in a, in a second. Um, we have a 60 second question fire round, rapid question <laughs> fire round. I've got five questions for you uh, to get to know you a little bit better. And uh, your task is to answer these questions as quickly as possible. Are you ready? Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. What's always in your fridge, Kat? Oat milk at the moment. <laughs> All right. Good enough. Uh, which book or books are you reading, if any? I am reading uh, the one of the last Booker Prize books. My sister has bought me all of the Booker Prize books since 1961 for my birthday, uh, and I'm on one of the last three. Okay. Uh, what was your first job? Ooh, my first job was in a sweet shop uh, when I was 13 years old in my primary school village. And uh, what did you want to become when you were a kid? Uh, when I was little, my first job I wanted to be, I wanted to be a lawyer. Mm -hmm. And and you uh, somehow ended up 
in the design space. <laughs> yeah, I actually wanted to be a solicitor, but I said I wanted to solicit. And my parents told me that that was not something that I really wanted to do. <laughs> um, maybe that was good career advice. <laughs> now, the final question is, uh, do you remember the very first time you actually got in touch with service design? Um, I don't remember the first exact time because I kind of fell into it, which is a bit of my background. Um, but the first time I realized that service design might be important was when I was working with the police and um, realised that actually the experience of trying to get in cold with the police to be able to report crimes online was just really, really difficult. And we needed to improve the service. I had no idea that there was a whole profession out there that could help the police to do that. Yeah. Oh, a lot of people roll and somehow, somehow stumble upon uh, service design. It seems to be like the common way people uh, get exposed to this field. Um, thank you for this. Uh, I'm hopefully uh, shared some things that uh, are aren't yet on Google, and now people know a little bit more about <laughs> who you are. Um, get before we dive into design for planet because that's going to be our main topic for today. Um, mm -hmm. Design council um, for the people who aren't uh, in the UK and aren't that familiar with the work of the design council. Could you sort of share a little bit more about that as well? Sure. Um, so Design Council is the National Strategic Advisor for Design in the UK. Um, the council has been around since 1944, actually. So it was set up by Winston Churchill's government just before the end of the Second World War with the express um, kind of aim of rebuilding the post-war economy through raising the standards of good design. And at the time... Good design really meant the design of, of products and, and manufactured things so that people could buy them and that could restart the post-war economy. And since then, Design Council has always been championing the value of good design. So that's our core role, but has done it in many different ways. So in the past, we've done big exhibitions all over the world showing the best of British design. Uh, we worked with um, the late uh, Prince of Wales, to um, His Royal Highness Prince of Wales to um, create the longest standing design prize ever. Uh, we have more recently done more design programs, really pioneering the use of design in the public sector, for example, um, giving rise to, um, in the UK at least, a market for service designers to work with local governments. And now, as I'll come to talk about, our um, mission is Design for Planet. Mm. That's really helpful. Uh, at least I didn't have all the background. I know the Design Council by name for many years uh, as, a, as a very respected and a credible uh, authority. Um, I don't think we have something similar here in the Netherlands. Uh, not yet, at least. Now, um, you mentioned that you're the chief design officer at the Design Council. Mm -hmm. What does that role mean within the grander scheme of what the Design Council is doing? So um, at the moment, we're doing three things. So we're championing the value of design through kind of our advocacy work and, and, and policy influencing. We are providing design skills to designers and also non-designers so everyone can know how to design really well. And then we run big design programmes with big institutions in the UK to really transform society. Now, as Chief Design Officer, my role is to kind of bring together what our design practice should be, our frameworks, our tools, our methods, um, making sure that we're using best practice, but also that we're learning from all the designers out there uh, who are doing cutting edge work and, and bringing that together and, and opening it out. So that's the first thing I do, which is around our design practice. And then the second thing I do is make sure that we've got the right enabling conditions for designers to do their best work. So um, probably because of my background as a policymaker as well as a designer, um, there's a small but growing number of those people. Um, I also am working a lot with government to think about the right investment, education, um, standards policy to make sure that there are the right conditions so that designers can design for planets and social outcomes as well as economic growth. 
how does someone become a chief design officer <laughs> at the design council? Um, so, I mean, there's been amazing chief design officers in the past. I, I feel very kind of honored to be in this position. I think, um, you know, a chief design officer is often someone who has got a handle on design practice, but can also work strategically. So helping the organization as a whole think about how to design itself in order to achieve the best outcomes. Um, you know, as I said, my background started in government, um, nothing to do with design at all. And then I was lucky enough to be in a position to be one of the, the co-founders of the government's policy lab, um, actually with a, an amazing woman called Dr. Andrea Siodmok, who was the previous chief design officer at Design Council who came over. So together we um, developed that idea um, with Beatrice Andrews. Um, and then I guess I, I wanted to also then get into service design. So I left government and joined uh, Us Creates, which is an amazing service design agency, which has since become FutureGov and then become uh, TPX Impact. So really doing service design uh, in uh, local governments on the front line. Um, and I guess the reason I joined Design Council is because I was really interested at, in being able to work more systemically. So as well as doing the, the design work in kind of on the front line, as it were, I wanted to also think about how you influence the wider system. So coming back to Design Council and working with government is a kind of halfway home. Mm -hmm. And um, speaking about the wider system, there isn't... Uh... <laughs> almost anything wider than uh, our our planet and that's i think the um the mission that you're on right now you mentioned design for planet a few times already um design for planet how how would you summarize it what is what what is design for planet that from well, your perspective <laughs> what is design for planet <laughs> um so you know designers have got this huge 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 opportunity i mean designers shape the world Kind of pretty much everything around us is designed in some way or another. Um, some things are designed really well and are good for the planet. And lots of things, many things, are not designed well and are actually making the climate crisis worse. And arguably, you know, design has been very good at getting people to buy lots and lots of things that they probably don't need. Um, and is probably part of the reason that we've got ourselves into this mess. So design for planet uh, really recognises the amazing skills, talent, creativity that designers have and wants to support and galvanise designers to design with the planet as a priority. And so in the UK, where the UK Design Council, there's 1.69 million people uh, working in the design economy. So 1.3 million of those are designers, professional designers. And then there's all the people who work in design firms um, to make all of that work happen, people working in finance and legal and marketing and so on. And our kind of primary audience, I suppose, is to support that community to really design with the interests of the planet at its heart. Now, obviously, that also means working with businesses, public sector and communities who commission um, designers, because actually you know, you need to be commissioned to design in the right way as well as being able to kind of have the skills to do it. So that's the kind of the overall mission. And I suppose what kind of dawned on me <laughs> in the middle of last year as we were putting this um, this kind of mission together is, wow, I've got an amazing design job as chief design officer here. Um, my users, I guess, are not a group of patients or a group of people who are accessing employment support or so on, they are the 1.69 million um, designers. And our job at Design Council is to, I suppose, provide a sort of service or a kind of enabling conditions infrastructure to support them to do their best work. Um, so yeah, it's huge and we need to do an awful lot of segmentation and all, 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 the, all the good stuff that you would do in a, in a kind of service design project to think about how we best support them. Mm. <clears throat> awesome. Uh, super interesting. And uh, I'd love to know more about that. But I, I'm also curious, like, um, this is a mission that the Design Council is on. But if you look at your uh, personal agenda and personal objectives, how does it relate to uh, what drives you as a professional? Mm. How has your journey into around 
and around Design for Planet evolved? Um, well, I mean, I, I imagine it might be similar to lots of other service designers. So I'd say, you know, out of the kind of the design practices that I'm most kind of at home with, uh, my MA was in graphic design because I was very interested in how you could open up kind of uh complex policy information to make it easier for citizens to be able to co-design policy with government um and graphic design is a key part of service design um, and then also going into service design so these two things are kind of where my background sat and i was always very interested in the more social aspects of things so homelessness health and well-being you know less less aware and less interested i would say from a professional level in the environment in biodiversity and, and so on and I think kind of my journey therefore is kind of very very similar to a lot of journeys that many of us have been on in the, in the last kind of five ten years about realizing how how much of a crisis we're in you know the climate crisis forget about not forget about COVID and I'm not trying to underplay all the things but you know it is it is the the biggest crisis that we're in and we have to start thinking about it um and and acting quickly with a sense of urgency and designers can do that you know designers are brilliant at acting at cutting through the complexity and and starting to act so um but i would also say that kind of my background um in service design and government has always been about thinking much more systemically about an issue and and the climate crisis is really really one of those issues where you have to think completely systemically it's not just about net zero at all. You know, if we have no bees on this planet, you can, you can get to net zero. But unless you have biodiversity as well, we're still going to be in a big problem. And then, of course, there's so much of the climate crisis, which is actually a, a, a social justice issue. You know, the people who are least responsible for the climate crisis, people living in the global south, are the ones who are bearing the brunt of Western consumerist patterns of, of extraction and and consumerist behaviour. So, so actually, you know, it is a social issue at all. Um, we're just coming at it from a kind of environmental lens. Now, it seems like a lot of disciplines, fields, expertise need to be involved in uh, in thinking and acting around this issue. I'm curious, how much activity have you seen from the design service design community in particular? Uh, about this how 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 does it relate to other design disciplines um yeah yeah so it's re so it's really interesting isn't it and um so i think you know my view would be that every single designer has got a big role to play and designers should not be working in their silos actually it's a holistic problem and we need fashion designers graphic designers product designers systemic designers architects service designers all of us um, to make it work. So kind of traditionally, you know, in the past, um, I suppose designing around kind of climate and sustainability has quite often focused on the more technical side of things. So what materials to use? Uh, what are the best kind of low carbon construction materials? What are the best um, kind of alternatives to plastic or kind of more durable plastic so you can kind of reuse them? So all of these are very kind of technical kind of almost um, engineering, material science type side of design. And that's often somewhere that service designers don't really work in. But what we have seen is actually the climate crisis is a massive behavioural and societal challenge. You can have all the technical um, kind of solutions in the world. And in fact, we've got, you know, we have got a fair few of them. But unless people adopt them, um, you know, that's not going to be particularly useful in service design in the way that it makes things easy um, and smooth and attractive to use is the way that we're going to get a massive behavioural shift. Um, if you think about, um, I was just looking at the government's 10 point plan the other day about the, the areas that are going to make the biggest difference to net zero, which is obviously their particular focus. Um, you know, transport, green transport, whether it's jet zero or um, active travel locally, um, a switch to renewable energies, getting people to take care of the natural environment. All of these things, there are technical solutions for them, technical designs, but actually we need service designers to make all these things 
into uh, experiences that are joyous for people and inclusive so that everyone can be part of it. And how much adoption are you seeing and how much awareness are you seeing in and from the service design community? So definitely a growing awareness. And I would say that when we talk about the 1.69 million um, design community, um, we say we're supporting and galvanizing because actually there are people from across all designers, including service designers, who have been doing this for ages. Um, so a couple of names come to mind, Ben Reason from Live Work, Claire Brass, um, uh, you know, Nat Hunter. All of these are people who've been working in the kind of product service design space for a long time. Um, Sarah Drummond, who founded Snook, has been, who's now at the Loch Lomond and Trossex National Park, has been doing amazing work. I think they're just hiring a service designer up at the park to really take a service design approach to creating amazing visitor experiences um, so that people can really enjoy the nature of, of the park in Scotland. So, um, and I know that there are there is also um, developed by um, Lucy Stewart, Ness Wright and Emily Tullow um, from a combination of SNUC and, and, and TPX Impact, um, a design service and um, design and climate service design community. So there are kind of voluntary um, communities growing around climate, but I think, you know, service designers still probably are, are less aware than other design professions about how to design for planet. Mm. <clears throat> I can imagine, like you mentioned, that uh, design disciplines that um, are occupied with very tangible and physical objects, um, the relationship to uh, the carbon footprint and our consumption patterns are very direct and very mm -hmm. obvious. Um, with services, it's maybe less obvious. So you men already mentioned a few names and some examples, but I'm curious, what are what are some um, encouraging uh, service examples where you feel that um, that that are designed from a planet perspective yeah. in a yeah. in a good way? Yeah. So I mean, there are there are there are lots, and they are growing. And you know, part of our role at Design Council is to kind of spread and communicate them. So when we think about, when I kind of try and chunk down how design broadly can, can support Design Planet, there's three areas and I've got some examples for each. So the three areas are designing kind of adaptable and resilient places with communities, um, designing for a circular economy um, and regen regenerating natural resources and learning from mother nature, best designer in the world. Um, and also making things easy and attractive for people of all types to live sustainably. So taking those one by one, in terms of resilient and adaptable places, um, you know, Leap is a really good example in Exeter of a um, design agency that is um, supporting active travel. So they are thinking about wayfinding and, and how to make all the uh, green travel that's available in the city centre, really accessible, um, really easy to navigate. And I'm sure <laughs> in the Netherlands, there are lots and lots of examples as well of really, really good services around kind of bike use and, and making sure that people can drop their bike off really easily at Amsterdam Central Station um, and kind of and find it again. So services around kind of transport are really good examples, but also um, increasingly services which um, help people connect with nature. So I mentioned the Loch Lomond and Trossex National Park, but just um, up the road, I can almost <laughs> see it from my house, there are there is the wonderful Walthamstow wetlands. And so wetlands are these amazing places where nature is actually providing us a service because it is um, providing kind of natural flood defence for us. It's also creating amazing biodiversity and giving us a place to to kind of walk and relax and, and is good for mental health. But because those places are so nice, actually people want to go there. So there's really good economic services there, whether they're tourist attractions, uh, places to get married and, and designing services around that is obviously um, really, really good. So that's a bit about kind of adaptable and resilient places. Um, in terms of circular economy, so a circular economy can only really happen if you've got services around it. So, you know, it stops the product becoming this kind of or being this linear 
static thing and actually um, encourages flow of resources um, into it and then also out from it. So you need a service to kind of collect the material that has been used in the product and, and, and you know, put it on its journey to turn into something else. Um, so some examples of, of that are Collie Box, which is um, a really nice, well, product, but with a service around it. It's London's first reusable takeaway box. And it's been created by the amazing Jo Lang, who is a force of nature. And um, so it's a kind of reusable, durable takeaway box with a um, barcode on it, which means the service allows people to take away and use it and then deposit it back so it can be cleaned and, and put back into the system. So a really easy digital service to go along with it. And then, you know, there's a massive within the fashion world who are doing amazing stuff around kind of circular design and, and reuse. Depop is obviously a massive online store for kind of Gen Z um, where, you know, it's a whole service about kind of reusing your clothes and selling them on and, and making sure there's a really good marketplace for that. Um, and then finally, things that make it easy and attractive to live sustainably. I mean, uh, the shift to renewable energy is one that we all have to um, to, to, to go on. Um, in the UK, we've got an amazing organisation called Octopus Energy, um, who create, you know, who are, who are leading a transition to, to heat pumps. But also, I mean, their design of their digital interface, the emails you get showing how much energy has been saved is just so well designed. It is a joy to use. And designers, service designers are brilliant at making things lovely experiences or Docomony, which is a credit card, which gives you a carbon limit as well as a credit limit. Um, so shows you kind of how where your spending is going um, uh, for the environment. So these are really good examples of where service design is being used for Planet. Mm, yeah, and uh, we'll try to add as many links to these examples mm -hmm. uh, as possible in the show notes, because I think it's good to see uh, service designers championing these uh, practices and showing uh, best practices or role models maybe uh, that we can live up to. Now, mm -hmm. uh, it's really encouraging that there are al already uh, so many examples and I'm sure you have many more, but um, if we if we look at uh, the broader adoption, like um, this isn't, you wouldn't be doing this if uh, it was already on the agenda of all of the designers in the service design space. Mm -hmm. So apparently there are still some roadblocks, challenges uh, we need to take away to have massive adoption. Could you share your thoughts about these challenges and roadblocks? Yeah, sure. So um, we did a kind of a quick and dirty survey just before Christmas um, to survey the design sector um, to understand what are their skills, capability and motivation to design for planet. And um, those who are interested in behavioral theory can see that there's a behavioral, <laughs> there's a behavioral um, theory tucked in there called combi. Um, so anyway, we, we surveyed kind of designers um, uh, and the, we surveyed designers who were coming to our Design for Planet festival. So it was a bit biased because we knew that they were going to be interested in Design for Planet. So we found that 79% of them said, yes, they were mostly or mainly motivated to design for planet, which, you know, we'd expect and is probably not quite representative of, of everyone. But even among those, and this is the whole of the design profession, 22% said that they did not know how to design for planet and 41% said that they did not have the opportunity to. So if you imagine that you would survey a group of people who are less motivated to design for planet, those two numbers are going to go up. But what's also really interesting about that is when we looked kind of closer and we dissected it by different design professions, there are some quite big variations. So professions like architecture, landscape um, architecture and urban planning um, had much higher um, understanding and um, opportunity to design for planet and you can imagine landscape architecture I mean you're working with the natural environment and biodiversity every day that's what your kind of job is urban planning you know they have recognized that carbon 
um, uh, construction um, contributes 40% of the UK's carbon emissions. So these are sectors that have already kind of, you know, woken up to it to some extent, although they're not all there. But the UK Green Building Council in particular has been doing a fantastic job. So, so there's those, but service design is kind of, it was much less, it's kind of similar motivated, but much had much less understanding and much less opportunity. And as I say, I think it's probably because service designers in the commercial world have mostly um, been asked to make things easier and quicker and less frictionless to buy and consume and use. Um, and in the public sector world, it has mostly focused on social issues like homelessness, like education, like health, um, and less about kind of access to nature or, or energy and so on. So all of that's changing, but and that's just my kind of hypothesis why. So in order to address both of those things, both the skills gap and the and the opportunity, we're doing a couple of things at Design Council, and we're just starting on our journey. So you know, way more to do. But um, in terms of skills, we're going to be creating a skills and re- a design for planet skills and innovation hub, which will be the place to go to learn about design for planet. And we're not doing this all on our own because there's amazing resources all out there already. So we're kind of collecting it together, um, but doing some of that translation work for where some of it can be quite academic or kind of technical or specific, trying to translate it into a, into a language that is more accessible. Um, we're creating more events and learning spaces where people can come together. So um, last November, we put on alongside COP Design for Planet Festival, which was, oh, I just felt like this amazing little space in between two COVID, COVID waves where people could get together. So we had 120 people up at VNA Dundee, uh, which is the UK's only UNESCO city of design. Um, and then we had 6,000 people join us online, which was amazing, amazing. And these were people from all over the world as well, so not just the UK. And what people said during that festival was, as well as toolkits and resources and so on, that's all great, but what we really need is spaces to connect and safe spaces where we can share our, our learning with each other and what doesn't work and what we don't know, actually. We don't want to do that in front of a client, but we want to do that within the design community. So we'll be putting on more events and learning spaces. And then the final thing that we obviously have to do is address that 41% don't have the opportunity to because clients aren't commissioning them. So this is not just something that Design Council has to do. I mean, this is the whole world changing, you know, government investment and regulation about getting all sorts of businesses to design, um, to, you know, create services that, that are good for the environment. But in terms of what we can do is we can raise awareness among clients, potential clients, businesses, public sector commissioners of the, of the need of the importance of putting design into the brief. And we've just put out a short um, kind of 90 second film that would encourage all designers to play to their clients at the start of a design project, which just has the Design Council red logo on it. And it kind of gives permission to designers to bring up the conversation with clients. But the other thing we need to do is create the right policies in place. Um, so alongside Design Planet, we're doing something called the Design Economy, which is our kind of every three years or so groundbreaking piece of research into the state of the UK design economy, um, into what value it creates, and then create a number of policy recommendations to increase that value. And we'll be making um, kind of suggestions about how Design for Planet is built into planning policy. So when architects and urban planners are asked to, um, well, hopefully retrofit and not build a new building, but they're doing it with uh, planet considerations right at the start. Or we'll be working with the um, standards, British Standards Institute, to help them think about product standards and making sure that those are all really environmentally sustainable. Um, thinking about how you kind of increase the visibility of the co- of the entire cost of a product to include how it is disposed of and making sure that we do that in a way that is inclusive and doesn't just make things hugely more expensive so that only rich people can afford them. 
So these are just some of the things that we'll be doing with government um, uh, policy. Mm. Uh, that's uh, that's a lot to unpack there. And uh, what I'm hearing is like, um, of course, there needs to be uh, a demand from the people hiring designers to actually work yeah. on this. And for some clients, um, some organizations will see like the commercial benefits of doing mm -hmm. this. Uh, others will need like a more gentle push from uh, government policies to actually start adopting this, uh, I guess. Uh, and the other thing is um, educating designers and service designers on mm -hmm. ways to actually incorporate this into their practice uh, into doing this now um let's say um let's say that you're lucky enough that you're a service designer who has found a client who is at least open to listening to mm -hmm. this story but you haven't done any projects that actively are incorporating design for planet what would you what would you do in such a situation like what would be their first steps to actually get this to create momentum and get this going yeah so the first thing that i would do is probably look at our systemic design framework um which is a our kind of evolution of the double diamond which many service designers will know and love or hate um but this is you know design council's world famous um design process which is i think has 600 million kind of hits across the world um, so the systemic design framework is looking, taking that as a starting point and really um, evolving it so it can address more kind of systemic and complex challenges like the climate crisis. And the framework is made up of different bits. It has um, a set of uh, principles at the beginning. Um, it has a set of characteristics that are important to have within the team to design systemically. Um, and then it also has a kind of a set of processes and questions and, and tools and methods. And what I would do is I would look at the principles to start and have a conversation with the client around the principles. And I'll run through them because there's only six. So being people and planet centred, um, being inclusive and welcoming difference, zooming in and zooming out, being able to see the bigger picture collaborating and connecting, testing and growing ideas, and finally being regenerative and circular. So these are six principles that would act as a really, really good starting point with a client right at the beginning of the, of the project. So that's the first thing that I would do. And then as you get into or before you get into the project, I would really... Um, you know, have have planet at the centre of, of the brief and really have that kind of um, as a consideration, but always be looking kind of bigger, I suppose, looking at the wider impact. So I was thinking just before I came on this, what are the things that service designers need to know about design for planet? And I wouldn't say that service designers have to become technical experts in sustainability or knowing, you know, all the kind of ins and outs of particularly which materials to use. I think service designers um, need to have an overall mindset um, and way of thinking which looks at the bigger picture, which unpacks and helps the client see the wider consequences of that work. Like, what is the supply chain? What are the conditions of people who are producing elements in, in the supply chain? Do we actually really want to be kind of getting people to... Um, you know, increase the consumption of this product if it's been bad, you know, if it's, if it's bad for the, the environment. So I'd say it's kind of more of those questioning, you know, showing the wider system and then supporting the client to kind of consider the environmental consequences. It sounds, um, it sounds to me like you really need to find the right clients. And uh, this can be like uh, also a very... Uh, competitive advantage from a service design perspective that if you um i don't know specialize or position yourself as somebody who is aware and designing with the planet in mind you'll probably attract you hopefully attract the right uh kinds of clients because i can see already like a big struggle trying to convince organizations who aren't maybe yet ready for this or have different priorities and um, 
maybe that struggle isn't worth it. Like it's maybe better to uh, put yourself out there. At, yeah. Well, I don't know. I mean, I think there's wider things, and this isn't for service designers to necessarily kind of have to tackle by themselves. There are wider things within business. I mean, business, I think, is waking up to the fact that, you know, climate change is a massive opportunity. And actually, if they don't start thinking about it, they will get left behind. I mean, that is the language, that is, that's the messages that are coming out of, you know, the Bank of England uh, business leaders, like in the UK, the CBI. Because on the one hand, businesses absolutely need to think about their scope one and two emissions and making sure their operations are net zero. But actually, if they can get ahead of the game and actually being, being creating products and services that are inclusive and good for the environment, then actually that's going to be a big market. So I think actually, you know, it's a strategic opportunity for businesses. Um, and I think, you know, service designers showing their green credentials, you know, is a really, really attractive prospect because design, you know, businesses don't necessarily know what to do. I think there's a certain amount of kind of um, lack of confidence, worry, concern. So, you know, this is the role of the service designer, not just designing the service, but almost being a coach to the clients and helping them through this. And service designers are pretty adept at knowing how far they can push things, you know, um, in, when you're working in a systemic way, you always kind of work on two tracks. One, which is doing something to make something better for the here and now and to win trust and goodwill and all the rest of it so that you can then open up the bigger questions. So, I mean, I wouldn't kind of say absolutely no, no to working with clients who um, are not kind of a thousand percent sustainable because actually part of the service designer's job i think is to probably help the client go on that journey yeah yeah and we've been doing that with uh the pers from the perspective of user centered human centered mm -hmm. uh so th th we should know a little bit about how to do that um it might sound like a daunting task to actually add a new element to that while um, many clients maybe aren't even ready yet to think about human centered but um we ha somebody has to do it, and I think uh, the design community is uh, in a very good position to actually uh, push this forward. Now, um, you mentioned something uh, briefly about uh, asking the right questions, having the right mindset. Um, what's the thing uh, that we're currently uh, missing or that would help us to ask those? But which questions aren't we asking that we should be asking? Um, I mean, I think it's some of those really, really deep reframing questions. So kind of, is this, you know, going back to basics, like, is this the right product to be creating in the first place? Or going back to like, why are we doing this? What's the overall outcome? Um, so, you know, if it's to um, help people get around the city quicker, then there's lots of different ways of doing that, which are kind of more sustainable than kind of pushing a certain product or service. So I think kind of always getting the client to really be able to articulate the kind of the overall outcome, um, which then opens up the space for different kind of ways of getting there. Um, and I think also uh, really being open minded and asking everyone to consider the wider impacts of what is happening um, wider impacts both in a negative way so what are the kind of bad unintended consequences of of the thing that we're producing but also the wider positive benefits so to go, take, go back to the wetlands example again which um, a friend and colleague Teo Adebowale shared with me she's an amazing designer who's been um, helping with the Salford wetlands that project started off as a we need to put in a flood defence and, you know, usually the traditional and technical answer would be a concrete flood defence. But kind of Teo's approach was to work with the local community. So this is something that service designers would absolutely do. Work with the local um, community to understand their needs um, and what wider benefits could be achieved. And so through putting in a, a kind of wetlands rather than a concrete flood defence, it also met the wider benefits for the community of providing somewhere to go, to relax, to run, to walk, um, to be out with nature. So I think there, if you can kind of ask these bigger questions, both about why we're doing something in the first place and also about the 
consequences and benefits, um, it helps the client see the wider possibilities. What, what's what's emerging for me from this conversation is uh, the word responsibility um, and taking responsibility maybe beyond your mm -hmm. narrow um, influence. Um, uh, is is that something that you've been hearing as well? Yeah, for sure. And with that responsibility comes a kind of, um, you know, opportunities for collaboration. And this, again, is something that, you know, businesses are going to have to go on a bit of a journey on, um, probably. So the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, who've been doing loads of work to um, kind of put circular design out there and, and really uh, create a market for it within businesses. Um, they're doing some interesting work to think about how, companies need to work together in a circular way because actually if you're if one if the if the waste of one product can be the ingredient for someone else and you're reusing things actually that's a, an opportunity for um companies to be responsible together and to collaborate and not compete so um so i think responsibility definitely and i think the other thing is that designers um you know designers don't have unions there's no kind of legal representation for them um, and so they often feel, you know, quite conflicted and, and not very confident about kind of standing up to a client. And so that's the other bit of work I think we need to do at Design Council is to help them give confidence and permission to kind of ask some of these questions at the beginning to help everyone be responsible. Mm. <clears throat> um, now, if we uh, the design for planet um i don't know how long has been it on the, has it been on the agenda of the design council um publicly uh so we launched it on the 23rd of september okay so you know it's quite recent four right? months yeah. yeah now uh, let's uh, and i'm sure you have some thoughts and ideas and hopes and dreams about this if we fast forward to three five years what do you hope will have changed mm. well we just had our strategy planning session there we go so, so this yeah, is good timing yeah, you should be able to drum this up <laughs> <laughs> so um you know in three years we expect to see a significant increase in the level of understanding and opportunity among designers to be designing for planet uh, we will have a global skills and innovation hub that the wider, you know, the wider um, design community can also access and where we'll be sharing latest frameworks and practice and, and bringing designers of all sorts together in our, what will now be an annual Design for Planet Festival. Um, and we'll have done some really transformational projects, uh, programs of work with some kind of sectors that could be quite traditional. So, you know, the energy sector or kind of, retail or some of these sectors where you know businesses are not saying yes we have to change and be responsible you know our job to make that market is to go out and work with some really pioneering leaders in those sectors to show what is possible and that those businesses actually when they design for planet can make a profit so that that opens up the market for other businesses and designers to to follow I'll follow up with that uh, on that in uh, in a few years. Um, mm -hmm. Next to all the resources and projects that you've already uh, mentioned, which again we'll try to link uh, in the show notes, are there any other recommended resources that you can recommend for people who want to dig deeper into this topic? Yeah, well, I'm going to give you a bit of a heads up. So we've got a new website being launched uh, before the end of March, which will start to bring together all of these these resources. Um, but I would just give a quick shout out to the Climate Framework, which has been put together by Mina Hussman, which is an amazing resource uh, for people working in the built environment and service designers need to work in the built environment as well, um, which just brings together a load of, of research and evidence about what works in that space. I mean, Ellen MacArthur Circular Design Hub is a great look. But two things coming out of Design Council I'll just mention is we have an amazing community of 450 Design Council experts from all sorts of different design backgrounds and across the country. And we bring them together on a monthly basis uh, so that they can share their collective intelligence about what works in particular areas of Design for Planet. So we've done three so far on inclusive and sustainable transport, 
on design for agriculture, for sustainable agriculture and food, and one on um, designing places with nature. And all of those write-ups are on our Medium blog. Uh, so do do check those out, some really, really good. Our Design for Planet Festival site, um, designforplanet.org, is still open. People can register and access all of the amazing talks and workshops uh, that we had there. So those are all open for people and, you know, just an incredible resource. Um, and then finally, we have just started a really exciting um, programme of work called the Design for Planet Fellows, where we've brought together uh, nine designers from very different backgrounds, from AI and tech, service, product, fashion, architecture, engineering, um, film, and their job is to use their kind of collective intelligence and all their networks into their different fields to bring together a new set of practice around Design for Planet. So we'll be kind of publishing uh, reports and data visualizations of that every month from now till September. Awesome, sounds cool. Uh, a lot of resources, people, anybody who wants to can already start doing this. There's no excuse to delay or uh, procrastinate on, on this. So uh, Kat, uh, sort of heading uh, towards the end of our conversation, I'm curious, <clears throat> If somebody remembers just one thing from this conversation, what do you hope it is? Um, design shapes the world, has got an awful lot of power and with that comes responsibility. So that responsibility for designers is please put planet at the center of the brief and look at our uh, 90 second film that will help you have that conversation with your clients. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, thank you for coming on. Thank you for addressing this topic. I hope that we'll be hearing a lot more about it in the coming months, years, and that we'll have some people inspiring service designers here on the show, maybe who are actually uh, putting uh, this ideology uh, mm -hmm. attitude into, into practice. Uh, so we'll have some more role models. So thanks again, Kat, for coming on and, and thank sharing you. this. My pleasure. Thank you so much. I really hope you enjoyed this conversation with Kat and got something useful out of it. If you want to check out some of the resources, they're all down below in the show notes. And while you're there, make sure to leave a comment on this episode. Thanks again for watching and I'll catch you very soon in the next video.